The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you to our fourth webinar in our webinar series entitled Cognitive Radio Networking in the ISM Band. Um, I'll start the uh, webinar with a, a couple administrative notes, and then I'll turn it right over to the speaker because I, I know you're all eager to hear uh, what, what John has to say. So first, the, uh, everybody always asks where they can find a copy of the slides. Uh, we'll be posting the slides on our tutorials and resources page immediately after the webinar. Uh, go to wirelessinnovation.org slash page slash tutorials and resources and you'll find the webinar there. Um, if you have any questions or lose the link, feel free to send me an email and I'll provide the, that information to you. A uh, little bit of information on the controls uh, that we'll, you will have access to during the webinar. Uh, you'll see that there's a, a button where you can make your control screen uh, large or small simply by clicking on the, the little arrow there. Um, if you're dialed in using microphone and speakers and want to switch to telephone, uh, simply click the button there in your audio mode section and you can dial into a number and, and put in your audio pin and that will allow you to, to listen over the phone versus using uh, voice over IP. We're going to do all the questions at the end of the session today. Uh, there's two ways that you can do questions. The first is you can use the questions window that you have and simply type a question in there. All those questions will come to me and then I'll present them to uh, the, the, uh, John in, at the end of the session and he can go through and answer your questions there. Uh, the other option available to you is you can actually raise your hand, and if you raise your hand, you're actually asking that you want to ask a question live, and we'll manage that again at the end of the at the end of the session. So, with that in mind, let me present today's speaker. Today's speaker is John Sider. Uh, John works at the Communications Research Center in Ottawa as the research manager of the Research Broadband Wireless Group. Group has developed a number of novel wireless communication technologies for commercial and government applications. John has published over 40 papers and holds seven patents related to wireless systems and devices. He's helped establish a number of successful wireless companies in Canada and has worked closely with Canadian industry in the development and transfer of wireless technology. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to John and let him introduce the rest of his team. Well, thank you very much, Lee. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the Wind Forum for giving us the opportunity to uh, uh, to uh, present to you uh, the work that we're doing on cognitive radio here at CRC. Uh, today's presentation will also include uh, uh, commentary and work by Siva Palin Nathan and Bernard Doré, who have uh, contributed to this work, and uh, they'll be uh, giving parts of the presentation. Jan Singh Hu, uh, who did the work on developing the dynamic spectrum access algorithms, uh, is not here today, but he has contributed uh, nicely to this, to this presentation also. If you're interested in more information on the work that we're doing, just go to the website that we have here and, uh, or contact us uh, offline later, and we can uh, we'll be more than happy to talk to you about uh, talk to the radio and our developments. So uh, the webinar will basically uh, give you a brief overview of cognitive radio concepts. Uh, we'll go into uh, details of our Coral wireless uh, cognitive radio system platform uh, immediately after that, and then get into the, heavily into the details regarding the implementation of cognitive control, uh, the operation of the sensing and Wi-Fi wi packet transmission that we have, and uh, we'll. Uh, get into the details and then end the webinar with basically a discussion on the dynamic spectrum access algorithms and the data mining capability of the system that we have. So let's get into the details right now. This is basically a, uh, a conventional wireless uh, system that uh, most of us are familiar with. Uh, you have a radio source and a radio sync of information. The radio waves are created and uh, they go through a, a channel, a propagation channel that is uh, typified by having propagation losses. You have interference on that channel. Some of those interference could come from uh, neighboring networks that maybe you might have some sort of control over. Maybe they're Wi-Fi networks that are associated with you. 
other uh, infer interference could be from networks they have absolutely no control over. In this simple network, you really don't have very many options of control. Uh, you can change the uh, EIRP, you can change the direction of the, uh, the signaling or the timing or the modulation rate, but you're doing this more or less blindly without any real understanding as to what effect you're having uh, on the data link immediately. With cognitive radio, we have a different scenario and different uh, situation. We have the ability to basically sense the environment now. We can sense the environment in a number of ways. We can either uh, uh, put sensors at the transmitters and at the receivers because the radio environment is different at both ends, uh, or we can go and access a database uh, and uh, extract information about our propagation environment or, or our interference environment from that database. The core of the cognitive engine is a uh, core of the cognitive radio network is the cognitive engine. Cognitive engine is the, the, the set of software that basically integrates sensed information, can integrate the database information, it could operate uh, using policy constraints or performance constraints, and it can set the operational parameters of your, of your radio network. It does the setting by basically changing the emission characteristics of the radio system or by changing the reception characteristics of the radio system. We can change, as previously, the EIRP, the direction, the timing, modulation rate. At the receiver, we can change the directionality of reception. Uh, we can monitor the, the type of interference we're getting, and we can suitably adjust the performance of the network uh, according to these sort of sense parameters. In more sophisticated cognitive radios, uh, we have the ability to cooperate with the interferers. Uh, in some of the standards, like 802.16h and 802.22, there is an element of collaborative control in that, and that you can see what your adjacent networks are doing, and you can send information back and forth with them. And the, the multiplicity of networks that form a coexistence community then can basically alter their emission characteristics such that the operation of the channel is optimized. We've uh, taken that basic cognitive radio concept that I had in the previous slide and have broken it down into two domains. We've partitioned the cognitive radio in, into a hardware entity and a software entity. The hardware entity for our coral system is what we call the Wi-Fi CR terminal. And it's basically the radio uh, that uh, we can alter the uh, transmission characteristics on. We can alter antenna patterns and, and timing on. And it's basically the uh, radio router that has been modified by us. The softer part of the uh, cognitive radio system is what we call the CRNMS domain. And uh, that basically controls the cognitive engines. It has the radio environment memory map. And it's the part of the uh, cognitive radio in which you uh, place the, or take the databases or the performance metrics and you uh, base them in this area of the, of the cognitive radio. How does this look physically? Well, these are the components of the radio system here. We have the hardware box here, which has the router in it. And we have then the computer, which basically carries the software. The two entities communicate back and forth with one another. Sensing information is sent to the computer. Control information is sent from the computer to the box by a TCP IP link. This is a fairly modular design. And you can assemble a variety of different types of cognitive networks with that. You can, for example, have a, a, a series of terminals and form one large cognitive network like you have over here on the left-hand side. Uh, one of the things I'd like to warn you about is that there's an awful lot of sensing information and a lot of control information that has to be passed back and forth. So you have to make sure that your processing is very powerful here. And we do find that there are processing limitations in the cognitive radio network management system because of, because of these uh, conditions on the cognitive radio network. You may decide that you want to partition your cognitive radio networks into two, into two competing networks. You can do that. You can run them off the same CRNMS. You can also set up a system as follows, where you have uh, one cognitive radio uh, network uh, complete with a CRNMS and Wi-Fi CR operating by itself. And then it basically operates in competition, maybe in collaboration with other adjacent networks. How you assemble a network is left to the, uh, the devices of the, of the experimenter and the researchers, and it is dependent on the type of problem that you want to investigate and the things that you want to look at. Here we see more of the physical details of the Wi-Fi CR box. 
Uh, it's fairly straightforward. It's got the router inside with our uh, some of our modified circuitry. It has antennas here that you can modify and change, and it has breakout boxes that you can uh, watch the performance of the radio network uh, on an oscilloscope, for example, or in a logic analyzer. Uh, again, I'd suggest you go to the website to get more details about how this box is constructed and what you can do with it. The Wi-Fi CR basically, as mentioned, is basically an 802.11G router that's configured to work in infrastructure mode. What we've done to it is we've imparted uh, the ability to do a TDD, TDMA type constraint on the CSMA protocol. Uh, in doing so, we've also been able to for example, a read packet addresses, and as a consequence of that, set up a beam steering uh, to, to direct those packets to specific antenna beams. Because we have TDD slotting, we can basically assign antenna slots or antennas to specific slots or packets to specific time slots. So you have this degree of temporal spatial control exercised by the by the uh, uh, what we call the Ethernet buffer board within the within the, the Wi-Fi CR. And then we have all the regular features of control. We can control the EIRP, the channel frequency. We can decide if we want to have acknowledgement policy running on the system. We control modulation rate. Uh, synchronization is provided by three means. There's a GPS technique. There's a technique that's based solely on the use of beacons. And then there's a technique that's based on ARPs, which will allow you to communicate, for example, or synchronize radios that are inside and outside building. Some more details about the, uh, the Wi-Fi CR box. Uh, we have the Ethernet buffer board, which basically connects to the uh, wireline Ethernet connection here. And packets that arrive into the, the box basically are buffered in, in the Ethernet buffer board. We examine those packets, and we make the decisions here as to when, where we want to send them out into which TDD slots. The TDD uh, uh, slotting and timing is, is derived partially by a GPS antenna, for example, or it can be derived by a beacon signal that comes off the Wi-Fi uh, radio card. The core of the radio uh, uh, Wi-Fi server is this Wi-Fi router card, which Siva will talk about in a few minutes. And uh, that radio card has two radios on it. It has a, a, a data link radio here and it has a sensor radio. The data link radio op op uh, operates just as a typical 802.11G radio with uh, synchronization imparted onto it by a uh, combination of operations that happen here in the EDB and by modifying some of the RF uh, pro, uh, conditions here. The sensor card is connected to the received part of the RF chain. And basically, it is the sensor that acts in promiscuous reception mode. So all the packets that are on the Wi-Fi channel are sensed by the, the radio card here. And then they're, uh, they're packaged, they're processed by the Wi-Fi CR, or by the bad Wi-Fi, rather. And then it's they're sent back to the cognitive radio network management system. So this is basically part of our sensing system in here. We have another sensing system here, which is the spectrum analyzer. That spectrum analyzer also connects to the RF receive path. And through uh, some machinations with the Ethernet buffer board, uh, sensor data is uh, taken, compiled, packaged, and then sent back as necessary to the CRNMS, where it's logged into the uh, radio environment awareness data map. Some of the things that we can do with this uh, uh, radio is we can change the front end. We can put a uh, RF switch here so we can have multiple beam antennas. It's also possible with some modifications to change the operational frequencies of the card. We haven't done this in all cases, but for example, you can run the system with the 6 to 700 megahertz RF and uh, operate it in TV white spaces if you wanted to. Some fast uh, descriptions here. Uh, this is the TDD, TDMA slotting that we have of, uh, with the radio. So you can see the access point and the client radios are operating in a TDD slotted mode and the packets are constrained to the TDD slots here. This is an example of the uh, system set up with a multi-sector beam antenna. We have a six-sector directional array here. And by putting the RF switch and controlling the switch from the uh, Wi-Fi CR box, we're able to uh, send packets to very specific antenna beams here. So this is another feature of the, of the radio system that we have. So that allows us, for example, to build uh, relay and multiple beam steering type configurations. So if you're interested in sort of like rural wireless cognitive networks, this is what one uh, application. 
You can have a, a scheduling uh, system drawn up for the, the radio system. The scheduler can be altered by the cognitive radio algorithms uh, to uh, uh, allocate beams to specific clients' terminals based on their uh, demand for capacity, for example. The system can change and alter its frequencies by monitoring the, the system environment and then making decisions, for example, on dynamic spectrum access so that it has a minimum amount of interference. Uh, with that, I'll uh, pass the uh, computer off to uh, Siva, and he'll give you some uh, details as to how the Wi-Fi router board works. So, uh, Siva, if you could uh, take over here. Okay. Thank you, John, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Siva, and uh, I'm responsible for uh, router board uh, software and the the old coding and uh, Linux uh, operating system and everything related to router board. And uh, this is my agenda for next 10 to 15 minutes. I briefly introduce the uh, router board hardware and the various software running on the router board. And one of them is the wireless sniffer. I will I will spend a little bit more time on the wireless sniffer because of the the cognitive feature, uh, cognitive radio, it needs the sensing information. Uh, that's very important for any cognitive radio network. So I will, I will spend a little bit more time on the wireless sniffer side. With that being said, just go to the router board. The router board is it's from uh, Microtech. And the Microtech makes uh, three versions of router board. And uh, we are using RB433 and RB433AH. That's depending on the available RAM and the CPU speed. For the, the access point, uh, we normally use RB433AH because of the, the CPU uh, usage and the, all the, the traffic has to go through, uh, through AP from client to client and, and everything. So we use, normally use the uh, RB433AH for APs and 433s for client. And all of them got three mini PCI slots, and uh, two of them are, are populated with, as uh, John mentioned, one is for the uh, link radio, and the other one we, we, we uh, use it for monitoring the environment. That being said, the two populated cards are, are with the, the from uh, Vistron's TM9 card. For the sake of coral terminal, the router board, when, when we say router board, that's, uh, we uh, treat them as a one piece. That means one router board and two radio cards. And the uh, CM9 card, it's, uh, it's based on uh, um, Athros um, uh, 5212 that supports A, B, and G. It's very popular in the wireless uh, open source community. As I said, it supports uh, infrastructure ad hoc monitor mod and mad Wi-Fi supports two more like a WDS and repeater mod but uh, in 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 coral uh, terminal we we are running infrastructure and monitor mod and the driver uh, it's the mad Wi-Fi driver it's modified uh, I will go through the modification and so on in the future slide and the this is the list of the software running on the router board and either either it, it came from the factory or, or uh, modified and uh, I uh, ported to the router board or everything I will, I will explain. The first one is the router board uh, booter that, that shipped the, whenever the, we, we buy the micro tick router, it shipped with the router board and that's the, the, the BIOS, you could you could use as a BIOS and that give you the, uh, Few options: setting the uh, frequency of the the, the processor. Um, you know where you want to boot the operating system from NAND, or you want to boot it from the e e Ethernet, or or those options you could select. And the main operating system is the Linux, and that's the uh, developed by OpenWRT team. And the driver, as I mentioned in the the previous slides, the Mad Wi-Fi driver. The NetSNMP is used for the uh, con core uh, communication protocol, communications to, from uh, CRNMS to the terminal. Also, Linux comes with it, uh, 
with uh, SSH and Telnet, uh, you could still still work, but uh, we use NetSNMB for the controlling and uh, transferring data back and forth from CRNMS. And the wireless sniffer, it's a very popular uh, uh, Kismet-based wireless sniffer. I will go through uh, all of these in a little bit more detail. And to start off with the bootloader and the booter. Uh, and I throw two few examples. There, there are few. There are many options, many menu options, and two of those is to give you the boat uh, device menu where you want to boot from Ethernet, NAND, or you know all all those things like boot the device, boot device. And the other one is the boat information. Uh, we need the the MAC address of that uh, Ethernet. Um, to to give the DHCP server to give assign the IP address and so on so you get it from from the boot menu and the next one is the the open WRT the mainline kernel is 2.632 and the open WRT team calls it as a Kamikaze 8 or 9 and I added the real time extension because we need to we need to, um, uh, multi-threading uh, uh, type of environment for um, communication the, through uh, CRNMS and communicate to EBB, uh, communicate uh, the, to the, the radio cards and so on. So I added the real-time extension. As John mentioned, the um, there is a EBB Ethernet buffer for board that does all the 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 packet-based uh, antenna steering and, and uh, packet scheduling and the synchronizer terminals and so on. That's basically driven by Beacon and, and also EBB got GPS, but there are two ways of synchronization. One is uh, Beacon synchronization, the other one is uh, GPS. If anybody want to use Beacon synchronization, uh, I need to alert EBB for the, the beacon reception and beacon uh, transmission. So that's why I, it's a, there's a modification for GPIO driver to, to alert the EBB. And there are many various in script uh, uh, just like any, any Linux uh, operating system. And this slides cover the MAD Wi-Fi driver, the driver based on uh, R3314. And there are um, many patches released by the, the MAD Wi-Fi team and the open source community. I don't usually apply all the patches. I carefully uh, analyze them. I mean, if it is related to, to performance increase or if, if there are any, any critical bugs, then I apply the patches. I don't apply if, if everything works I don't just leave it I, I don't apply the patches and there are a few cross compilation issues and crashes I apply those patches and the the, the major modification for coral in terms in, in the mad Wi-Fi driver for as I said in the previous slide we need to alert the EB for beacon reception and the transmission that that's uh, modified in the MAD Wi-Fi driver. Whenever there is a beacon received or, or transmit about to be transmitted, I alert a GPIO pin and uh, that alert the um, the EBB and that's set the the time slots or, or restart the time slots and so on. Uh, most of you know that the MAD Wi-Fi uh, 802.11e support uh, QoS type of traffic and so on. So. For curl terminal, because of the the uh, the packet set scheduling and so on, and and uh, we need to have a very deterministic transmission. So I disable all those QO, QoS features and I use best effort for all the traffic, including management and control traffic. And the number of field tries, we we tried uh, many field trials and long distance, about 12 kilometer, five kilometer. So we we uh, we tuned the MAD Wi-Fi driver for uh, um, number of retries. By default, MAD Wi-Fi give uh, 12 or 13, and right now it's set to five, depending on on the on our experience we we had uh, with the long distance uh, performance. And the diversity enabled uh, uh, as CM9. There are main and auxiliary ports. There are two ports. And uh, right now, uh, I enable the diversity. That means 
whenever there's a packet to be uh, uh, received, it check both uh, the, um, the RSSI, the RSSI of the packet received on both and, and discards the one it received the lower RSSI. And as I said, uh, we need a deterministic transmission because of the scheduling. And uh, I did played with the CCA and back off. That means CW min, CW max, and min. If you set those value or, or if you fix those value, it's always back off at the same amount of time every time. Like that means even if the channel busy or not, it backs off the same amount of time. And CTS RTS is disabled as uh, as most of you know. It's 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 another overhead we, we to to um, to solve a hidden terminal problem. So right now uh, we we disable the CTS RTS and uh, uh, we could turn an on and off act policy. That's also included in the in the MAT five five modification. That being said. Uh, Let's move on to the, the next software piece running on the router board, that is NetSNMB. As I mentioned, that's the core uh, um, communication protocol we use to uh, control the terminals and the transfer data from CRNMS to to the terminal back and forth. This is a brief use case use case diagram, and uh, what are the controls? Uh, what could be a user control to the, the, the terminal? Um, you could see, as you could see, if one of the, a user can send a message to the terminal saying, "Okay, go and monitor all the channel or just one channel, and send me the request data and any notification, error notification, and uh, configure the terminal in terms of uh, channel, SSID, TX rate. You want to turn on off act policy, change the power." And as I said, there is another hardware is developed by CRC. It's the EBB, and EBB is connected to the router board via serial port. And if I want, if a user want to to send a command to the EBB, he needs to send through via router board. And 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 there is a, a NetSNMB package that packets to be sent directly to the EBB. And the NetSNMB, it's the 5.1.2, that's the, the, the core version. And uh, we are running v2. We, we are not supporting v3 yet. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we, I don't apply all the patches, but the relevant patches to fix uh, critical or, or any major bugs. For the for the coral, uh, uh, I implemented 802.11 MIB or, or, uh, and few modification I made to can handle all the radio related configuration command just like uh, rate uh, ssid no act policy or all, all radio related uh, command and um, there are few modifications there are addition to get the statics collection that means let's say at one point in time you want to see how many phi error or crc error or how many retries happen that give you the, the the quality of the link so, so that that that's also added, and uh, a new sniffer agent Im implemented. That means, if you want to uh, send a command to sniff all the channels or one specific channel, you you uh, that sniffer agent implemented in the router board that handle all the requests and uh, communicate back to the CRNMS. And if I, if we, if a user want to direct a command to the EBB. He could do that so even using a NetSNMB packet, and also various coral specific command. Let's say you wanna you wanna get a how many uh, clients are associated and what's the RSSI they they are uh, they are they they are associated with what quality and so on. You just issue a command that gives the RSSI values along with the the associated client list. And the wireless sniffer, it's it's very important for our cognitive radio network because you want to see the environment and make a decision upon upon the the uh, that that specific snapshot of the environment. And that is based on Kismet, and Kismet uh, it, it's significantly modified for on demand because Kismet is always sniffing, and it, it's a it's a different architecture. Uh, if you know Kismet. Uh, 
it, it has a Kismet drone, Kismet server, and a Kismet client. Uh, right now, in our coral terminal, we disable all, but we using the, the packet capturing engine from the Kismet and modify it for our needs. And it supports Canada and Europe band, the, the uh, MAT Wi-Fi, if you specify the country code, just like your Net, Netgear router, you go and specify the country code, that will ask you, okay, yeah, are you sure you are in that country? That type of uh, information you could do so with the with the uh, with this wireless sniffer. You specify the country code that will, uh, let's say you you uh, you you uh, give the country code eight or two eight or three or or two or three. I forgot for Germany, and then it will give you the channels one to thirteen. And if you could give it a country code one for Canada and U.S., that give you one and one to eleven. And the wireless sniffer is basically, it's a CM9 card and, and, and along with the MAD Wi-Fi driver in moni monitor mode. And it captures only the 8211 packets, row 8211 packets. It can, it can detect any other preamble, only 8211 preamble. Corrupted packets are encountered. That means if I'm able to decode the preamble, then I will be able to tell a little bit about the rest of the packet. That's what it means. Even if the preamble is corrupted, I can I can decode the packet. That means I discard. I increase there is a, I receive a corrupted packet, but I can get any information. And as I said, it's controlled by SNMB. And also, you will see we could highly customize, and um, I will I will go through. Uh, the customization in the future slides. So let's look at the capturing process. How how are, are the sniffer works? That's what this basically means. So each channel, the sniffer spend about 500 milliseconds per channel. That's including the the hardware settling time. And uh, we could we could easily uh, change that uh, um, um, the, the time interval. And also the, the the interference we collected. It's um, we collect uh, source MAC address, destination MAC address, BSSID channels, and etc. That's every bin is created based on this. If any of the, them it's different, let's say packet type, you everything same. It's a packet type is different. There is another bin is created, and those bin is created in within the 500 millisecond if I receive. Um, multiple packets, I just increase the, the bin and the number of packets received in that bin. And these are the information captured from a packet or from a node. The capture time, GPS locations come from EBB. EBB got a GPS chipset and that gives the, the synchronized the local system time and also the GPS location. And all these you could pretty straightforward and, and uh, you could go through later. Um, the customization part is, if you want to see, let's say you want to see all the packets from a specific node, you, you, you tell the sniffer, okay, you give the MAC address, you give me the packets received only from for this node. And or let's say you want to receive, you want to see all the management packets or control packets, and you could customize that too. And as I said, if a, if a preamble is not uh, corrupted, you could ask for the sniffer to give the complete preamble. Also, channel utilization. Just say you don't want to see all the packet. Just give me the channel utilization. You, you instruct the sniffer that give you the channel utilization. All those are statistics collection, statistics collection, number of corrupted packets, retransmission packet, how many retries for one node, and 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 all those information. Also, those of data we could customize. And that being said, the the it, it, it's a heavy process. The the sniffer it's heavily used the CPU, and I throw this uh, um, real example when when you, you instruct the terminals to sniff all one to eleven channel, the CPU usage goes to ninety percentage, and the memory usage as well. So that's why in the future we are planning to, to use a higher CPU with a more RAM and a powerful computer. 
that concludes my presentation, and I will hand it to uh, to Bernard, and he will take it from here. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bernard Dury. I'm also in the co in the coral team, and I've been responsible for the CRNMS. In in cognitive radio, you know the the official definition is that a cognitive radio has to have sensing capabilities, control capabilities, and learning abilities. The CRNMS, which stands for Cognitive Radio Network Management System, is the framework that pulls all these capabilities into one place so that you can experiment with cognitive radio without having to worry about the little details. Siva and John just described a lot of the capabilities of the coral terminals in terms of sensing, in terms of control. The role of the CRNMS is to bring those capabilities to a, at a high level so that you don't need to worry about the details. You can just control your network. So the CRNMS is a software that you would run on a laptop or a desktop. And it, it serves various purposes. But the main one is what it'll do when you start it and you've specified various parameters. It'll keep uh, discovering what nodes are part of the cognitive radio network and will collect interference data about all those nodes and save it into a database. And it will also provide you with the means to explore this data, to use this data, and also to control the nodes. You would control the nodes either from the GUI, which is very useful as you start learning about the Coral platform, so you can easily experiment with various setups and see the effects. But it is also very useful for debugging. It also exposes an API, which is the more interesting part, because it gives you all the controls over the cognitive radio network that you can code into your program. So you can devise your own algorithm to implement certain behavior, whether it's primary user detection, whether it's an opportunistic algorithm which would detect unused, um, unused frequencies and start using it. So the, the three major interfaces to the CRNMS are the GUI, the API, and the access to the database. And in the next few slides, I will quickly go over these different interfaces and how they can be used. Now, what I would like to stress is I'm going to go over this in, two, in you know, five, 10 minutes. There are usually, there are a lot more details, so I encourage you to go back to the Coral website and John gave the URL at the beginning of the presentation because there, there are a lot more papers, there's information, there are also videos describing uh, how to use this ERNMS. So let's talk a little bit about the API. So as I said, it allows you to query the state of the various nodes in your, in your cognitive radio network allows you to change the configuration of these nodes and also allows you to access the database. So as the CRNMS is running, it collects information about interference. Siva has talked about the Wi-Fi interference for one thing. Well, all this information is put into a database that you can access. So these APIs are currently available in C, in MATLAB, and in Python. So as you want to try a new algorithm for you know, primary user detection or opportunistic, opportunistic web spectrum usage, you could write your code in C, MATLAB, or Python to experiment with these and see the results on your net bandwidth. The AP, these APIs we actually generate from a higher level language, which is called WSDL web service description language. So we actually 
currently generate them for C, MATLAB, and Python, but we could generate them for other languages as the, uh, you know, as the need arises, for example, Java. So what would you use this API for? Well, John described some scheduling TDD capabilities in the oral terminals. Using the high-level APIs, you could actually specify the code words that are pushed on the different terminals to synchronize how they, they, they work together in the time domain. The terminals also support packet steering per packet steering for the antennas if you're using multiple antennas well once again you could populate into the terminals the the antenna routing tables that will specify which antennas to use for which terminals to to favor uh, spatial reuse you could also control from this API how you collect interference um, when you start the CRMS, you can, on the command line, you can specify various parameters as to what kind of information you want it to collect and how often you want it to be collected. But you can also later change these parameters from the API so that you could have a program that intelligently turn more aggressive data collection for a certain period of time. And when things are stable, you could reduce it to minimize the load on the terminal. So on this slide, I, I'm quickly listing um, some of the function calls that you would have in C, in Python, or MATLAB to control your terminal. And I won't go over the details. I just want to stress that the whole point of having the CRMS framework is that it makes it very simple to control the terminal. So if you wanted, for example, to change the transmit power on one of your terminal, you would just specify its MAC address and you, the new transmit power and call the appropriate function to, to make, it, make it so. The reason for using the MAC address instead of the IP address is that the MAC address doesn't change. So if you were in a, a more dynamic environment where terminals would um, roam or shift from one AP to the other, you could keep tracking them with their MAC address even if their IP did change in certain scenarios. So we provide these APIs. Now you can build your cognitive engine, which would be you know, the intelligence that control your network. As one of the toolbox that we provide with the Coral, with the CRNMS for the Coral system is we have a toolbox in MATLAB that allows you to get to the data that is being collected, you know, real time by your Coral terminals and plot them in different ways in, in, uh, in MATLAB. So in this example, we're showing the interference collected by the different terminals over time and showing their, their, the power. That's just one of the different ways that we, you can show the data in this toolbox that we've created for MATLAB. But you could obviously do similar things in, in, in the other languages because the same APIs are provided in all languages so that you, you can get to all the data. You can control all the terminals. So I mentioned briefly some of the examples. I listed some more. So definitely these terminals as sensors to collect interference data. You can also write a cognitive engine that will sense the interference and adjust the various parameters to maximize your throughput or to minimize uh, interference with your peers. You could also use it in, in white space kind of scenarios. So that was you know, my brief introduction of the API. Now let's talk a little bit more about the database. All that information that is being collected by the Coral terminals, by the CRMS, using standard, AP, standard interfaces, is being put into a relational database. And we've used a, a standard proven 
tested SQL database for many reasons, but one of them is then you can use the full power of the SQL language to get to the data that is of interest to you. So that RIM database, the Radio and Environment Awareness Map, has four tables. The first table is the in interference table. It has the, the Wi-Fi interference collected by the various terminals that is put into the, the uh, relational database. The next table is the spectrum data. Each coral terminal, in addition to having you know, a Wi-Fi card to collect Wi-Fi interference, it also has a spectrum analyzer card. So that data, if it's enabled in the CRNMS, can be collected periodically by the CRNMS and put into the database. The next table is a table tracking all the nodes currently in your cognitive radio network and providing additional information about them, including possibly location if, you, if they have a GPS fix. And finally, the last table is more of a, a framework for primary user detection. So we do provide some hooks for people to implement primary user detection, and there's a table that could log these events in the RIM database if, if it's enabled. Why did we use this SQL database, uh, more specifically Postgres SQL? Well, for one thing, it's been truly tested, highly robust, highly scalable, but also, very importantly, is that it, it gives you very flexible access to all the data that is being collected by this year and a half. One of the design principles that we used when we started this project was to give the maximum flexibility to the users so they can get to all the data and control you know, the terminal. Because we can think of 10 ways of using these terminals, but I'm, I'm quite sure that all of you could co come up with many other ways. So we didn't want to restrict how you can get to the data. So when you want to get data in, from the RIM, you actually just build an SQL query and pass it to the RIM database using the APIs that we provide. So the kind of things you can do, well, you could get the various in interference from a selected node. Since it also logs timestamps for these, um, this information, you could just get the information that was collected in the last few minutes. Since the nodes also report their GPS location, you could actually restrict uh, the interference data that has been collected by nodes within a certain radius of a, a point that you, you specify. So as you can see, a lot of flexibility into getting the data. The, the last two slides is just quickly go over the, the GUI. So, we provide these APIs, we provide that database, but we also have a GUI that will allow you to uh, real-time see the, the spectrum analyzer data that is being collected, you know, mapping the location of all the terminals in your cognitive radio network, and many other things. I've only included here two of the screenshots, but if you go to our website, you can get to, uh, to the other stuff. So I'll pass back the, the microphone to John to finish up this part. Thank you very much, Bernard. Let's uh, get up a little bit and have a breath of fresh air here and get into some applications. Uh, we've gotten into very high de technical detail in the last number of slides. Uh, I'm going to have to brush through this as fast as Uh, Wi-Fi CR terminals and the uh, CRNMS do all in collecting the data. The data was collected by these terminals and assembled into a massive uh, RIM database 
which was then mined. Uh, Salim Hanna, one of our colleagues here, went through uh, with MATLAB into the database and was looking for various features on interference. Uh, one of the things we found here, for example, these are the sensors. Uh, collecting data, uh, we can see that each sensor here sees a different uh, amount of interference on it. Uh, what's interesting here is the blue bars indicate the number of uh, unique interference just to that sensor alone. What this data seems to indicate to us is that the interference environment is very non-homogenous, that it changes as a function of uh, geographical position rather rapidly. Uh, that can be uh, verified by even looking at the spectrum occupancy as seen at various sniffers. So this is sniffer 1, sniffer 3, and 4. Uh, and you can see that uh, each one of the sniffers sees uh, different occupancy on the channels with time. Uh, again, indicating to us that uh, there's a quite a, a geographical variation in, uh, in the uh, uh, interference environment. I'm just giving you one example of some of the, or some of the examples of the, the stuff we can do with the REAM database. Uh, you can slice the data in another manner. You can just take a one, one node, for example, look at the occupancy on that, and then you can break it down in terms of the occupancy, in terms of the management packets, control packets, and the data packets. And you see some anom anomalous behavior here. You, for example, there's management packets seem to be relegated to channels uh, 2 or 3 and 11, but data packets seem to be uh, all on channel 6. I don't know why this behavior exhibits itself in the interference environment. But it's something for those of us who are interested in the dynamic spectrum access are probably going to have to investigate in greater depth and detail. Slicing the data even further, for example, you can log the various users in by their IP address and look at their activity as a function of time. So each sniffer sees different types of activity for the users. Uh, on the right-hand side here, we see a CDF of user activity done over a 10-minute sample for these sniffers. And as you can see here, 50% uh, of the activity here in the link is of uh, interference activity is uh, contributed by only about a half a dozen users, a dozen users or so, uh, while the, the other 50% of the uh, interference activity has about 280, 290 users. So again, this behavior sort of shows us the distribution of interference in the environment, and it's something that uh, those of us who are interested in, uh, in dynamic access algorithms are going to study in greater detail. We can do correlations on the data. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we're running out. But uh, you can take uh, uh, data from various sensors and cross-correlate and auto-correlate it to find out the correlations. And if you read this slide later, you'll, you'll see what I mean by that. Let's get into an actual algorithm that we implemented. This is a dynamic spectrum access algorithm that Jan Seng Hu implemented. We wanted a three-kilometer link that had uh, a Wi-Fi uh, DSA algorithm running on it. And uh, the link itself was prone to interference from foreign Wi-Fi and online line of sight uh, blockage. So uh, he basically went through the process of collecting uh, interference data with the REAM, put it in the database, analyzed that data, then came up with an algorithm that would adjust the operation of the link. And this basically is the algorithm itself. It would be basically uh, collecting data at each node. He measures the RSSI and the duration of the interference. He converts that basically to utilization on per cha channel for the, for the, uh, the interference. So let's, for channel 1, for example, we find that the, the, there's a utilization of about 20% at this particular period of time, and there's an energy level for the interference pack of 3.7. That's converted into an interference score, which basically weights the utilization and the energy together. And F and G are the uh, channel condition values here. And he, these are sort of like the uh, uh, values that tweak up and balance out the interference score for each channel. Each channel as measured at, at each one of the component uh, receivers. So we've got the access points in the station, both coming up with interference scores. And he further weights these interference scores to give us an interference index. The interference index then is used to select the most appropriate channel for the link. And uh, going through this mathematics, again, I'm sorry for going through this so quickly, but uh, he was able to come up with a dynamic spectrum access algorithm for the link, and he compared it against the random channel access selector. So you can see that this is over a 24-hour period, and this is how the DSA algorithm uh, works versus, for example, a random selection algorithm. So this is an example of uh, the work that we're doing with Coral. We're doing other, other types of uh, developments and, uh, and experiments, but uh, it, just, it just shows you the flexibility with the system. 
I guess with that, uh, I'm sorry it's taken so long, but uh, I'll leave it for questions. And uh, uh, Lee, are you there? I am. Um, we've got a, a few questions here, so I'll I'll go through them, and um, we'll 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 see what will fit in our time. So the the first question is: Have you tried distributed network with one CRNMS per AP? And CRNMS uh, have coordinated have to coordinate. And um, let's go with that question, and then there's a there's a follow up question related to that. Sure. Uh, no, that we haven't. Uh, we, We've only done that in the in the uh, lab environment, but yes, you can run. Uh, uh, you can create a, a whole series of uh, cognitive radio networks and then write algorithms for each one of the CRNMSs for let's say collaboration or competition exactly for for uh, spectrum space, and uh, they can have uh, antennas and that they can be adjusted. So yeah, that, that's one of the uh, sort of experiments we want to do out in the field, and we're thinking about. But yeah, that's that's very possible and possible with this system. Okay. Um, the next question, the follow-up question is, why did you put management control packets in the same queue? Uh, practical 3G, 4G, dot 16, dot 22, et cetera, don't actually do this. If control packets can get through, it makes it difficult to share performance usage and interference information. Um, because of the scheduling, that's why uh, we disabled the 802.11e features and, and put uh, everything in, into one queue, but uh, uh, um, we could easily put it back, but the only it will suffer, it will, uh, it will, the AP and client started sending those messages in, in, in their in, in, uh, not allocated time slots. That's the only problem. Other than that, we could easily put it back to the, the priority queues. Uh, the next question I have, what's the nature of the modifications made in Kismet? Okay, the Kismet, as I just explained, um, the, the, the Kismet is used a client, drone, and a server type of topology. The, the, if you get a Kismet uh, software, it works like that. And uh, if you start, if you let it run drone, it's always uh, sniffing the channel, sniffing all the channels or whatever the channel you specify. It started keep sending all the packet to to the to the to the server. But we don't want to do that because it will suffer a lot because of the CPU, the limitation on the router board and so on. That's why we say we 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 modify to on demand scanning. That means we instruct that the, the terminal go and sniff and give me the snapshot. That's the that's the major modification. And the, the other other modifications are I remove the the client and and the server uh, portion of the code. Only the sniffing part portion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question we've received. Is the sense data abstracted and fused in Ream, or just put there, and the cognitive engine takes care of making sense of the data? We we put the raw data in the Ream database because we don't we, we don't want to assume how it would be used. So we get want to give the maximum flexibility in terms of what's available, and then people can use uh, their own SQL filters to to just get to the data that is of interest to them. Okay. Uh, next question. Could you please describe the features from the MATLAB plot, threshold versus spectrum holes and the 2D spectrum holes? This is, uh, well, the, the, one of the, the, the one that I showed on, on the slide was providing uh, the evolution of our CRNMS system is collecting, in this case, um, spectrum analyzer data on each terminal. And that 3D plot that I showed was actually showing over time how that spectrum measurement was evolving for the, uh, the different frequencies that are scanned by the, uh, the spectrum analyzer data. So one dimension was time. The other dimension was the frequency from 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz, and you know the third dimension was the the strength of the signal that was uh, sent at that time at that frequency. Okay. 
Uh, we only have time for one more question. There's several more in the queue. So what I suggest is um, perhaps we can send the answers to the people who've submitted questions, and the, those answers can go out uh, those that, uh, after the webinar is over. OK. So if that's all right. So the last question, um, let me pick one. Can you talk a little bit about the multi-antenna capability and how it's being leveraged by Coral? <clears throat> Uh, the, what we, the whole idea of the multi-antenna capability is that uh, for some applications like rural wireless, you only want to have uh, one access point, uh, and instead of having, let's say, if you want to ha go to three or four or five sites, instead of having a router for each one of those sites, what you can do now is uh, uh, use one router, and then it just basically uh, uh, partitions the time uh, for specific directions, and it sets beams for those specific directions. Uh, there's a lot to be gained from having a higher directivity uh, rather than broadcasting in a non-directional manner. And uh, with Wi-Fi, uh, we felt that uh, there's uh, some uh, benefits to be garnered from that, from being able to uh, both eliminating uh, interference and uh, also having uh, an EIRP gain with that. So uh, yeah, we're very interested in using directionality and controlling antennas by means of directionality. Okay, thanks, John, and thanks to everybody at uh, CRC for providing the uh, webinar we've presented today. Um, I think the um, contents were really, uh, really well received by everybody who was on the line. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, we'll be sending out a, a link to the webinar satisfaction survey to all the attendees, and that uh, survey will. Uh, we ask everybody to fill out that survey. It, provides us feedback on how we can make these webinars more useful to, to you, you all as the audience. Um, our next webinar will be announced next week. Uh, it'll be held the end of October, beginning of November, and so watch your email to get the announcement. And just one final notice going out to everyone, we're going to be releasing our requests for topics for the next round of webinars. That'll go out next week as well. Uh, so if you have ideas for what you'd like to see in future webinars, please you know, provide us with that input. And what we'll do is use that uh, in issuing our request for proposals. Uh, and our RFP for the next round of webinars, which will be in the January, February timeframe, that RFP will go out on 7 November. So if anyone's interested in presenting a webinar, uh, please contact me or respond to the RFP when it goes out. With that, I want to thank everybody for participation and thank again to the, to the presenters. I know it's a lot of work to pull one of these webinars together. so. Uh, so on behalf of everyone, we, we really appreciate you all at CRC doing this for us. Well, thank you, Lee. And uh, with that, I'll close the webinar. Thanks again, everyone.